OK, it's just about 10 o'clock now, so we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us for this media availability to discuss back to school. Please mute your microphones and turn off your cameras now. Today we have with us Dr. Kenny Bramwell, St. Luke's Children's System Medical Director, and Dr. Brian Olson, St. Luke's Children's or St. Luke's Behavioral Health, excuse me. We're here to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Dr. Bramwell and Dr. Olson will provide you with some of their thoughts on heading back into the school year, and then we will open up to question and answers. When it is time, please raise your virtual hand and I will call on you. When you hear your name, unmute yourself, provide your name, news organization, and to whom your question is directed to. You can also ask questions with the chat fe feature if you prefer. And as a reminder, please mute yourselves and turn off your cameras. With that, we will start with Dr. Bremo. Hello, good morning, and thank you for having me and for being interested in this topic. Uh, we seem to be at a rather crucial point here in this pandemic. Uh, we have the Delta variant coursing through the country, unfortunately uh, overwhelming some of our hospitals uh, in the southeast and in Texas. Uh, we seem to have uh, the perfect storm, if you're a virus, uh, of lots of people who have not been exposed to this virus before and relatively low vaccination rates here in Idaho. So this is a, a very worrisome time. I will share with you that uh, each day we are seeing more and more patients who need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, we are not yet at the crisis point that we were at last November and last December, but we are certainly headed that way and it's very concerning. Um, at this point, we still only have a few patients admitted to the hospital who are minors or who are children. Um, we have had a pretty consistent number of patients admitted to the hospital for the last six months where we have a few patients, uh, children in the hospital at any given time with COVID. The concerning thing now with this Delta variant, uh, particularly as kids go back to school and they'll probably be around one another a lot more than they have been over the summer, is that this Delta variant tends to be two to two and a half times more contagious. And if you uh, look at the mathematical models, it, it looks like we may be seeing hundreds or thousands of people needing to be admitted over the next few months, which is uh, truly scary at a point where we're at maximum capacity right now. Uh, the biggest concern that I think is facing us as we get back to school is uh, people are tired of COVID and they'd like to move on and uh, they'd like to stop wearing masks. And I think that that's an ill-advised but very prevalent strategy right now. Um, we, we have some school districts that are talking about it. We have other school districts that are sort of refusing to engage and just ignoring uh, the, the data and what's coming. And uh, I'm a bit concerned as to what that will represent over the next few months for our, for our children in schools. And uh, I'll, I'll pause there. So, yeah, and under most circumstances, um, kids respond pretty well to, most kids respond pretty well to changes, but the um, recent um, pandemic and COVID-19 has created a situation where we're inundated with continuous changes and it adds that stress, making it harder to make successful adjustments. So. Um, some things to look out for to see if you notice somebody who is uh, struggling um, or needs some extra support. Um, particular things that that I look out for are changes in um, behavior, emotions like uh, sleeping too little or too much, being uh, significantly more irritable or guarded than usual. Um, if you notice yourself or someone struggling, um, one of the first things that I recommend is to get back to the basics. So notice um, good eating habits or sleeping or exercise. Um, also, be careful not to try to make too many changes at once. Uh, maybe sometimes it's best to identify a few priorities and then pace yourself as you work through those changes. Um, as caregivers, we're not always part of the problem, uh, but we have to be part of the solution. 
And one of the solutions is modeling appropriate behavior ourselves, having confidence that we can figure out whatever the challenge that lays ahead of us and being able to help our, our children with that. Um, sometimes that means that as parents, uh, we need to seek out extra support for ourselves or focus in on self-care. And sometimes it means that um, we have to work how to respond to not knowing all the answers or improve how to manage uh, things that are just distressing, such as um, being overwhelmed or tired with having masks or other kind of um, uh, things that we're doing to protect ourselves from from COVID-19 as we get ready for school. And so monitoring our own reaction to that can be a big, a big help to helping kids. So that's, um, that's all for me. I'm going to kick back to Michelle. Thank you both. I appreciate your comments there. So we'll open up now for questions from media. And as a reminder, please raise your hand. Wait until I call on your name. You can unmute and ask your question. So if you have questions, please raise your hand now and we will call on you. Okay, uh, yes, go ahead. Shira? Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. No, oh, perfect, hi. Um, so in terms of, you know, going back to school, what should parents be weighing when sending their kids back to school? Are there like key things that they should focus on in terms of safety? Yeah, that's a great question, Shira. Um, I, I will refer you to a couple of documents uh, so that this is not viewed as my opinion only. Um, there are documents from the Centers for Disease Control as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics in the last month where they have both, uh, and these are, these are national bodies, they have both emphasized the importance of in-person schooling. I, I think we can all recognize that remote schooling, al although convenient, um, is nowhere near as good as uh, in-person schooling. And both of these organizations emphasize the importance of in-person schooling. And they also both emphasize the importance of masking for all kids at school. Um, the idea behind those, I think, uh, I think we can all agree that in-person schooling is, is better than remote. Um, remote is, is okay in a pinch, but not, not optimal long-term. And the other thing, it, and the other recommendation is that all students should mask uh, regardless of vaccination status. It, 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 that sounds mean and that sounds like we've pivoted from where we were um, hoping to land, uh, uh, where patients who were vaccinated could be unmasked and patients who are unvaccinated would need to mask. Um, certainly that's where we would all like to get is fewer masks. But it turns out that this Delta variant is so overwhelmingly contagious that the, the best thing we can do in settings of, uh, of concern is to, is, to, is to mask everybody. So that, those would be my recommendations for how to make things as safe as possible for our children is to uh, send them back to school in person and to mask everybody. Um, the, the, the challenge we have is there are people uh, and perhaps even leaders who have confused personal freedom with public health. And, and they feel that wearing a mask is an infringement on their rights and they are going to make uh, uh, a statement and show that they're just not gonna comply with that. Um, that's, that. That is unfortunately great news for the virus and bad news for our collective health. Um, I. I, I, I am very concerned at this point that the contagious nature of this new variant means in essence, we all have two choices. Choice number one is to get vaccinated and to minimize the effect of this virus on our bodies. Choice number two is to not get vaccinated and to roll the dice as to what effects this will have on our bodies. Um, I, I don't think any of us are going to get by not getting this Delta variant uh, based on how contagious it is. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Thank you. Uh, Ariana, I see that you are next, and then Carolyn, you'll be after her. Um, so my first question is, could you expand a little bit on what St. Luke's is seeing in terms of the coronavirus cases in children? If you could kind of give us numbers or just um, expand a little bit more on that? I know you covered it earlier, but. Sure, sure. No, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I will say back in November and December of last year, 
we saw 16 to 18 cases each month uh, of patients who were admitted to the children's hospital with COVID. Um, since that time, we have seen between four and six cases each month, and that has not yet changed. Um, uh, based on the first week of August, uh, we may be headed uh, into a new phase, but for the last six months or eight months, I will say, we've been seeing four to six patients admitted to the hospital. Now, now bear in mind, uh, in, in broad strokes, children represent 20% of the population. Um, they represent about 10% of the cases of COVID. Uh, they represent about 1% of the admissions to the hospital. Uh, and that, those are national data, not just ours. Um, so one of the challenges is if you are or if all of us are focused just on the patients in the hospital, uh, we, we may miss the boat just a bit as far as how many patients get this illness and unfortunately how many patients spread this illness. But to answer your question, uh, we, we are and have been seeing four to six patients each month uh, who need to be admitted to the Children's Hospital here locally. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Uh, Carolyn, I have your hand up next. Yeah, hi. Um, so my question is, how do you protect patients or sorry, kids who are under 12 um, physically because they can't get the vaccine, but also um, from a mental health standpoint, um, they're not able to get the most powerful protection that there is. So that was probably is kind of stressful for them. So. Yeah, I think you bring up an excellent point that that, that patients under 12 do not have uh, what, what Dr. Souza has started calling the bulletproof vest of the vaccine. Um, children under 12 right now can still not get any of these vaccines, so they are to some degree more vulnerable than the rest of us who have the option of getting the vaccine. Um, I would say that the vaccine is our greatest tool in this pandemic. Um, when we do not have the vaccine available, we, we, we are left with sort of second team options. Um, and, and those include uh, masking, uh, distancing, and uh, I'm gonna call, call it room and hygiene and air hygiene. Um, th those are the best things we can do in a setting where people can't be vaccinated. So back to one of the comments I made earlier, you know, in, in, in primary age children, who have no option right now of getting the vaccine, masking probably becomes even more important than it is normally. And I'll see if Dr. Olson yeah. has anything else to add. From, a, from an emotional standpoint, we've certainly seen a huge increase in referrals or from struggles from kids who, not necessarily from wearing masks per se, but um, like you said, worrying about, am I going to get it as one of my loved ones going to get uh, coronavirus? Or are they going to get this Delta variant? It's a scary thing that they hear about and they don't know all the, the information. And so um, as a parent or as a caregiver, being able to do everything you can to help protect them and also um, being able to <clears throat> help them understand the basics according to their level. Uh, every child is different of what kind of information they're able to handle and how they can handle it. And so being able to um, know what that, what that level of information is for them and help guide them through giving them a space to talk about it and as best as possible, help them uh, work through some of their concerns. If it is uh, having to, as basic as, you know, I have to wear a mask all day, when can I take a break? Helping them problem solve of when they can have a safe break. Help them figure out um, places to go outside of school or things to do outside of school so that their only focus isn't wearing masks or going to school or things like that, that they can get a break and, and uh, still experience a, a portion of what we would have considered typical normal life um, so that they can still have a focus, a break from uh, all of their worries. Michelle? Thank you both. We have a question that came in from Karen on the chat, and then after that, we'll go to Nicole. 
So Karen asks, I have heard that St. Luke's has had to send children out of state due to high rate of hospitalizations. Is that true? And then the second question is, and what else are they being treated for besides COVID? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Karen. And unfortunately, that is true. I will share with you that the reason that the children's hospital here, as well as all children's hospitals, the, the reason that um, most children's hospitals get overrun in the wintertime is because of viral infections like RSV and influenza. Uh, there, there is not a preventive strategy for RSV and it tends to be an enormous problem for newborns and infants in the first year of life. Um, it is the most contagious virus uh, or is the most problematic virus for children uh, the, in that age group. That virus is usually the reason that we are out of beds every winter. This last winter, this last respiratory season, even if you go back as far as October and then through April, we did not have a single case of RSV. Now, you contrast that with, with what is usually hundreds or maybe even thousands of cases of RSV. We just didn't see it last year. It, it turns out that when people are being careful and wearing masks and staying away from uh, people who are sick, uh, it turns out that all viruses uh, uh, plummet. Um, we weren't seeing influenza. We weren't seeing RSV. We weren't seeing strep throat. All of the things that are horribly contagious that people get from each other, we just didn't see last winter. So now we have this sort of pent up demand, or I will call them infants who haven't been exposed to RSV. And when things opened up in May, all of a sudden we started seeing uh, RSV. And, and we have had a few times over the summer where we have been out of beds in our children's hospital here. Um, largely because of RSV, but that's not the only reason, but it's certainly a big reason. We, we are seeing a combination of, of, of summertime surgeries and injuries and wintertime viral infections all at the same time. So both uh, June and July were, were very busy. I think July will end up being our busiest July that we've ever had, uh, both in the Children's Hospital and within St. Luke's. So unfortunately, we have had to send a handful of kids uh, to local or other states uh, for their care when they're sick enough to be admitted. And, and we don't like doing that, but in, the, in those cases, we felt like it was the safest thing to do uh, because we just couldn't take care of them here. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Uh, Nicole, I have you up next. And then Ariana, I have your hand up again. So if you'd like to ask a second question, you can go after Nicole. Hi, this is Nicole Camarda with Channel 6. Um, this is obviously a stressful time for children going back to school, and Dr. Olson, you kind of touched on this already, but for parents, this is probably one of the most stressful times for them going into this um, school year with an influx of cases coming on. So what advice would you have for parents during this? Um, and either of you, if a child does contract COVID while they're at school, what advice do you have for the parents in this situation? Because they're probably just going to, you know, instantly... Um, go under a lot of stress. So what advice would you have um, for parents in this situation? That's a great question. And as we know, start of school year brings on a whole lot of changes for the whole family um, from the whole system can can be affected and changed. And sometimes those changes are good. And like Dr. Bramwell mentioned of having kids go in person, there's a lot of benefits that kids get with uh, going in person to, to school outside of their academic growth. There's a lot of social emotional growth that they that they experience there. Um, from a parent standpoint, um, one of the biggest things that I help parents with is to be able to understand where your um, how much energy you can spend on on particular tasks um, and to be able to sometimes just pace yourself to know Look, all of these things that I see are great ideas, but I don't have enough energy to to do all of those things. So let me prioritize to the things that are mattering most. And so identify what those pieces are and focus in on those. Um, when 
when we experience extra stressful times, adding even little components to our daily lives or things that are that are going on can uh, become quickly overwhelming. And so monitoring those pieces, um, uh, one of the biggest things parents can do is to be able to make sure they're continuing to take care of their own mental health and their own stress level. Um, and uh, to be able to seek out extra support in that way if they need it. Uh, as, as far as if, uh, from a mental health standpoint, if uh, a child uh, gets COVID, I think that varies greatly depending on how severe they are and how uh, well functioning they were prior to uh, getting that. Sometimes it might need that they, they take a break from school and they're able to keep up. And sometimes for some kids, they might already be struggling in school and that really just creates a huge bind. And so uh, keeping in close communication with the school and trying to problem solve in that moment the best uh, possible solution for your child um, when that happens or if that happens. Thank you. Uh, Ariana, I have your hand up again. Are you looking for a secondary question? Yes, yes. Um, and so I know this is kind of addressing the media briefing tomorrow, but I was wondering if someone could quickly address the decision to pause certain elective surgeries and procedures and which of those um, procedures will be paused. I think that we can wait on that one until tomorrow's media availability. Okay. Uh, I have another question, a few questions actually that came in from Karen. Karen asks, the children being admitted for COVID, are they having serious lung, et cetera, problems? And then the secondary question is, Dr. Fauci advised that teachers wear masks. Would you suggest that for vaccinated teachers? So, so the first question is about how serious or what sort of complications are we seeing? You know, we are seeing a subset of patients who have the most serious grouping of symptoms that's called MISC, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, we've, we've seen about 15 of those cases uh, in the last 15 months. Uh, so we are still seeing those patients. Um, they have all recovered very well. We have not had any fatalities, which is a, a fantastic result, but there are occasional children who get into that level of, of sickness. The majority of children that we're admitting to the hospital um, are not getting that degree of multi-system involvement, um, but there, there certainly are, are patients who have um, either cardiac or respiratory complications that are, are difficult, but that respond uh, pretty well to other therapies and, and, and time largely. Um, the next question was about uh, what Dr. Fauci suggested. So in, in, in the setting of a school district that, that requires masks of everyone, that, that's kind of a moot point, um, and both the children and the teachers will be wearing masks. In the more common setting where the, the school board uh, is either not talking about masking or saying that they're not going to mask at all, um, uh, I think that's that, that's that's a problem and a setup for a whole lot of disease to be spread child to child. In the setting where the school board has given people the option or is recommending masks, um, uh, I think that the teacher should wear masks for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, I, I think it sort of, if the teacher's wearing the mask, it will be a little less uncool to have a mask on. Uh, Two, I, I think it models good behavior for the children, um, along with sort of taking the stigma away from it. And three, this, this COVID variant, the Delta variant is so contagious that I think all of us should be wearing masks when we are indoors in large groups. So I agree with Dr. Fauci there. Um, of course, who am I to disagree with Dr. Fauci? But but I, I think he's I think he's correct that you know, this this new variant is so contagious that that we should continue to mask when we're in high risk settings. And sometimes that's a large group. Sometimes that's a poorly ventilated space. Sometimes it's a, a low vaccination rate in the community. Um, and, and sometimes it's all of those things. So I would I would certainly support teachers wearing masks uh, indoors in the classroom. Thank you, Carolyn. I have your hand up and this should be the last question for us today as I know our providers have other engagements. 
Yeah, I was wondering, so um, if a parent is noticing some of those signs of um, like a, a, their child under stress, having mental health issues, I guess, so what is the point where they should maybe seek medical attention or an expert opinion and like where, where should they go? What should they do? So, One of the first uh, steps is to, if you're trying to resolve those on your own and it, and it, and it works great, if you feel like you need extra support or something's not working when you're trying to say um, uh, there's chronic irritability or you can't get your child engaged the way you need to, um, check in with your pediatrician as a first good step. There's a lot of good online resources that parents can go to to get some specific ideas. Um, uh, and a pediatrician often is the, the first uh, good step to be able to reach out and say, is this something that is part of typical child development or is there something that we need to step up support for this child and uh, what might that be? Uh, sometimes that might be including the school a little bit more, kind of adapting some some pieces there, but uh, a pediatrician is going to be a good support for for those parents. Terrific. Um, it looks like we can actually get, Ariana, if you have another question quickly, because um, I know Dr. Bramwell has another engagement. Um, do you have another question? Yes, real quick. So we know the Delta variant is a lot more contagious. Is this variant more deadly? Could you kind of explain explain that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, the short answer is I don't think that we know if it is more deadly yet. We know that it is quite a bit more contagious and that there has been a huge uptick in the percentage of children who are being admitted with COVID in the states uh, where, where this is a big problem in the Southeast, I'll refer you to. Um, it does not seem that the death rate is higher with this uh, new variant than the other ones, but, but one of the, the, the quirky things about this is, you know, the, the exposures happen on day one, uh, day eight, so the second week, you start having symptoms. The third or fourth week is when you get hospitalized. And then the fifth and sixth week is when the fatalities may start happening. So, so I think we need more time to know if the fatalities are going to be higher with this variant, with these large numbers. What I can tell you right now is that the, the number of patients who are admitted in these other states is higher than any other time in the pandemic so far. So what we know so far is that it is markedly more contagious and seems to be affecting young children to the point that they get admitted at a higher rate than any of the other variants that we've seen. But I don't think we know yet if it has more effect on, on the mortality rate. Thank you so much. Well, with that, we will conclude today's media availability. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell, for your time. And we appreciate all of our media partners who joined us today. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.